Peter, thank you very much for agreeing to talk to me today. It's a pleasure, I hope. You were born in 1929 in the Melbourne suburb of West Brunswick during the Depression. You grew up playing golf at Royal Park near the Melbourne Zoo. It was not a particularly famous golf club. How did you first get into the game? It attracted me and drew me to it. It, was, I, it wasn't the other way around. Did someone introduce you to the game? Was there a, a parent or a friend? It intrigued me. I was playing cricket at the time for the church, Presbyterian Church, and football for somebody in the winter, I forget who. <laughs> uh, but um, I was prepared sometimes to be on my own as a loner. Uh, and play golf. And you always preferred to play holes rather than hit balls on the practice fairway. Why was that? Well, the fact, the trueness of the matter is that I, I had to, I didn't have any more than two balls at once. Uh, so that it was restricted any practice uh, where you hit a bucket of balls as they do nowadays. And when did you consider that you had developed uh, an aptitude for the game? Well, when I was getting scores. I, w I would play uh, on the links and uh, not pay <laughs> and then uh, I would start counting. So that's how I got to do, do sometimes of, of all things a 69 and then a 68 and so on. And that's really what golf's about. Not how many balls you can hit off the tee 400 yards. It's uh, how, how many strokes you take to play each hole. And, and Norman von Neider was a great influence on you and on your career? Somebody invited me to, to go with him to Sydney. And at the time, he was staying in the Aaron Hotel in Sydney, downtown Sydney, more a pub than a hotel. But Norman had a room there and he took me to the room and, and showed me all these slacks he had in the wardrobe. He must have had about 20 or 30 slacks of various colours. And I thought, wow, you know, this is what golf pro is all about. <laughs> and was that the moment you thought, I want to be a golf pro? Yes, I'm going to give it a go. But lots of people saw it as a, a sad uh, transverse into golf and into playing the pro game because truthfully speaking you couldn't make a living uh, out of just being a pro. You had to earn it and you had to play exhibition games where you could and um, earn a, make a living that way. Because you played many exhibition games didn't you with, with Bobby Locke in South Africa in particular? Yes I did. Uh, Locke came to visit us in Melbourne in uh, I think in 49, um, but he invited me when we were playing at Victoria Golf Club to come down with him to uh, South Africa and he got somebody there to tee everything up and we were busy, we played a match I think every day for nine weeks, uh, which earned a lot of money. And by the end of the nine weeks, did you consider that you had his measure? I th think so. I didn't. I never was better than him. He was always and will always be a champion golfer. Uh, but I won a f as many matches as I lost, so I'll put it that way. And before you turned professional, you were working in the Spalding factory. What were you doing there? Earning a living. <laughs> uh, the Spalding company was. Uh, the smartness decided that if they tied me up in a, with a job in the factory, I'd play with a spalling ball and win a tournament, and that would be uh, my contribution to the prosperity of Spalding Golf uh, Company. And when you turned professional, that was it with Spalding? You, you left the factory and you never went back? Well, that's right, yeah. When I started moving around and travelling, uh, I couldn't hold a job down anymore, a fixed job, I had to go with the ball. You played a bit in Asia and then you had two years playing in the United States as a professional in 1953 and 54 before you went to Europe. What were those two years like in the US? 
Well, the tour itself, what's called uh, the, the PGA Tour now, uh, was pretty rough affair in those times. It's, I'm not being critical, but it, it had, like anything, it had to be born and it had to grow. And it hadn't grown by 1952, I can promise you. We played on pretty poor courses, not country clubs. And you eventually went on to Europe, and you said in your book, that it was the hard, bouncy ground of the European courses that attracted you. What did you mean by that? I like playing on a course where the ball bounces uh, because as a, time went by, I found I had an advantage. Somehow I, I, compre I comprehended that kind of play, uh, you know, watching the ball bounce forward and making, making something a, a three instead of a four. But um, uh, you had to, I had to learn both, frankly, bouncing and non-bouncing. You had 28 wins in Europe between 1954 and 1972. And when you arrived, you were playing against the likes of, of Henry Cotton and Di Reese and Charlie Ward. What was the European tour like in those days? Well, it was just a little bit better than the American tour, except that uh, it was founded on the older pros who, of course, had to be at their stations on Saturday, every Saturday and Sunday. And so tournaments had to be played uh, and finish on Friday. That was one of the, one of the peculiarities that I could uh, smile at. But um, now I, I love playing in Britain. The, course, the courses there are marvellous. And, and Henry Cotton said to you when you arrived, there's no way you can make it as a touring professional. Is that right? Yeah, he, I was teared, paired with uh, Henry and um, he said, uh, you know, nice to meet you and I hope you be happy with, you, with your new life. And uh, I said, thank you very much. He said, you don't expect to make a living out of playing golf, do you? Or playing tournaments? I said, uh, well, I've got an idea in my head uh, that I am. Impossible. He said, impossible. You can't do it. So, of course, his life was uh, such that he, he couldn't play golf every week. There just weren't that number of tournaments. And you fast forward 55, 60 years and you see professional golfers making $10 million when they win the FedEx Cup. What's your reaction to that? I was born at the wrong time. <laughs> and practice wasn't a big thing for you in those days? You said that you used to just hit a few wedges just to loosen the limbs and, and get the grip uh, right. Yeah, it was. Tr there's some truth in that. Um, because uh, I was pretty fit and always ready. Uh, it didn't hurt me to have to tee off you know, when the bell sounded. Peter Allis tells the story that he watched you hitting a few shanks before the start of the 1955 Open and he asked you if you were going to the practice fairway to uh, try and sort it out and you said, I'm going to the hotel to think about it. And you won the event by two shots. That's a new story there. Uh, that's a fact though. Uh, by coincidence, it, it, it works. <laughs> Do you think that today's golf professionals practice too much? Some of them need it, and some don't. Obviously, today, Peter, you're most remembered for your five Open Championship wins. Uh, your record in that event was remarkable. In the first 21 times you played it, you finished top 10 in all but three of them. What was it about the Open that brought out the best in you, do you think? Well, I used to set it every year as my target. I wanted to win it again. <laughs> because people ask me, you know, You've won five Open Championships. Why have you done that? I'd say, well, the prize was so small that I had to, it was all gone by Christmas. <laughs> Your first Open win was at Birkdale in 1954 by a shot over Bobby Locke and Di Reese and Sid Scott. And you tapped in the winning putt uh, famously with the back of your putter. And George Duncan was, was very upset with you. He scolded you for being so relaxed about it. Do you recall that? 
it wouldn't wouldn't happen these days? No, no, they wouldn't. But uh, no, it was a spontaneous uh, move on my part. I was so overjoyed that it, I didn't think a, a four-inch putt would uh, really offend the establishment. And you won that event with a set of clubs that you had borrowed the day before. Can you tell us that story? Well, <clears throat> I was spending uh, the, the months prior to the Open uh, in America. And I was contracted by the McGregor Golf Club. And uh, they issued me with a set of clubs that, uh, to be prompt, um, that were no good. And I wanted to change. And I, in the lead up to the championship, uh, Tony Penner, who was the McGregor uh, liaison officer, um, he said, well, you've got to use them. That's what we pay you for. So I w went away and snuck into my corner and said, I, this is silly. I can't win the Open with these clubs. I, I, I might as well stay at home. And uh, it came to me that I could borrow a set that was a decent set of clubs, of irons and a driver and a three-wood, from John Letters, who was a lovely Scot who had a factory in Glasgow. And I said, John, can I borrow one of your sets of clubs? And he said, uh, yeah, of course you can. And uh, he went to the boot of his car in the car park, and it was a box. And in the box was a set of irons, untouched by anybody. Anyway, I said, thank you, I uh, I'll hope I do it good, and uh, I'll give them back to you if they don't work. So anyway, they worked, and I gave it back to him. Gave him the set of clubs back. And you didn't ask him if you could keep the clubs after you won the event? No, no, it was uh, spontaneous, and uh, he deserved them. And you won the Open again in 55 and 56 and 58 and 65. You must have, you must have felt like you owned the event by that stage. <laughs> well, it, I did. When I lost it and somebody else uh, acquired it, I thought, what's he doing with my cup? <laughs> After you won your third Open at Hoylake in 1956, uh, famously you didn't have a jacket to accept the claret jug and uh, you had to borrow one. Can you tell us that story? Well, it was the custom uh, at the time, in fact, since the beginning of time, uh, that one should get dressed for prize giving. And that's what uh, I did. I, I tried to take a jacket from the stack I had, but I forgot to bring one to the club that day. So he said, we're going to do the prize giving on the club veranda there. Uh, can you come quickly? I said, well, no, I haven't got my jacket. And he said, well, never mind. So on, on the, ru the rush to the club, a uh, hundred yards away, I saw Max Shaw and I said, Max, can you, would you lend me your jacket? And he said, oh, of course, yeah. Well, he was the same size and shape. And so he very kindly lent me his jacket. Uh, but, of course, it went, he went back to Melbourne in no time at all. And just as, it, as would happen, his wife put the, went it through the pockets before she sent it to the dry cleaners, and she found a cheque for a thousand pounds. Oh dear, I felt, I felt a bit uh, sheepish about that. And what could a thousand pounds buy you in those days? Well, you could buy a decent house, truthfully, uh, in a nice suburb. It was uh, a substantial bit of money, I must say. So those Americans who claimed that the prize money at the Open Championship wasn't big enough were really passing up the opportunity of maybe making a big win? I think so. Uh, I didn't encourage them, of course, to, but I said, they used to say, oh, well, you, you know, you've got an advantage playing in Britain. I said, I, I come from twice the distance you do, you know, across, just across the Atlantic. I'm beyond that by double. And, uh, of course, they couldn't uh, argue with that. Your last win in 1965, again at Birkdale, must have been particularly sweet because three 
of the best Americans were in the field, uh, Nicholas Palmer and Tony Lima, and the Americans were largely absent for your first four wins. So it was important that you could prove that you could beat these fellows. Well, I got myself into good form uh, that, that time, which was the, going to be the last time, although I didn't realise it at the time. Uh, so it didn't matter who it was at the other end of the stick, I was going to do a good score. And if they could beat that, well, they, they deserved to win. So that's how we started and that's how we finished. But I was very so sad to find that uh, soon after that, uh, in a small light plane out of uh, an airfield in the Il Illinois, uh, they had a crash and uh, poor Tony uh, was lost. You continued to play occasionally in the United States. You appeared with Ben Hogan during the first two rounds of the US Open at Oakmont in 1953. What was it like playing with the great man Hogan? Well, it was, uh, I thought, mar a marvellous experience uh, to get near him. Uh, he, did, he wasn't very vocal uh, and talkative, but uh, just him playing uh, was a wonder, wonder to watch. But I'll tell you about him. The first morning, when we teed off on the first at uh, Oakmont, uh, we went down downhill. It is you can see, uh, and when we got down there, the crowd had got around the the balls on the fairway, and they, they had ropes there. It was before they kept people off the fairway. They allowed you to run on the fairway, and. Um, it took some time for them to clear. I was the shortest driver uh, off the tee, and uh, looking ahead at the green, I could only have a little gap of about 20 feet to get through, to get onto the fairway. And that happened actually for the whole round. And it took a long time to get the people off the fairway. Anyway, the next morning, Joe Dye, who was the manager of everything in golf in America, he was, he was the chairman of the board or something. Uh, he said to Ben, as they were handing out the cards, uh, now Ben, you, you were very slow yesterday, I'd like you to play faster today. So <laughs> Hogan opened his trap and I was most amazed because never, I never heard him speak up to there. And uh, he said, now, if you think you, you're going to give me two-stroke penalty, give it to me now so I know before I start. <laughs> no, 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 says Joe, no, just play. Just play fast, please. Someone described Hogan's swing as like a machine stamping out bottle caps. Is that how you saw it? I'm just I'm trying to imagine that. But, uh, no, he, he, he had a, a forward uh, movement which I remember, you know, for instance, he teed the ball opposite his left foot. Iron or wedge or driver, always out there. And then he moved into it. And I thought, why does he do that? Sam Sneed doesn't do that. In fact, Sam, of course, kept his head still. And I went for that. I said, I'm going to do that. Whatever Sam does, it's going to suit me. And what about playing with the likes of Sam Snead and, and Byron Nelson and some of the other great American players of that era? Well, looking back, I realise what a, a joy and honour it is that you are, you are with them. Uh, you know, I, I remember playing with uh, Byron Nelson at, uh, at Augusta, where everybody turned up to, to Bobby Jones' pic picnic. And what was it about Byron Nelson's game that you thought was particularly impressive? He had an amazing record. Uh, Nelson was, he moved a foot down, to, to, he swung at it, but down he went to hit, to actually hit the ball. And uh, this all puzzled me for a while and uh, uh, I'm, I'm grateful for have seen it because I just took a little bit out of it for myself and put it in my pocket. 
So you, so you had to choose between Nelson's game going up and down and, and Hogan's game going left to right. Which one did you prefer? Well, I decided just to keep my head still. So, in your opinion, Sneed was the, the best of the three? I think so. He's the most natural, uh, gifted, uh, physical player. He would have been any Olympic event you could think of. He'd, he'd be good at it. Sneed was famous for being able to touch the top of the door lintel with his foot uh, while his other foot was on the ground. Did you ever see him do that? Yes, I saw that. I saw it. We did it in Syracuse, New York. The media fellow with his camera wanted Sam to do this so he could take a picture of him. So he said, will you do it for me? And Sam says, sure. So with that, his foot came up like a, a big spring and hit the architrave. The photographer said, oh dear, you were too quick, I missed it. So will you do it again? He said, I'll do it again and I'll do it real slow. <laughs> so then he did it slow. And if you think of it, that's pretty hard to do. And Sneed became a friend of yours on the US tour, did he not? How, how did that happen? I was generally sober and, uh, and well behaved. And uh, he, he went, when, t uh, when uh, accommodation was tight, uh, we could do with an extra bed somewhere. So Sam, you would come with me. I said, OK. He said, but don't come home before nine, nine o'clock. <laughs> Snee played up a little bit. <laughs> well, I'm not saying, am I? <laughs> and what about the likes of Lee Trevino and Billy Casper? Did you have much to do with them? Oh, yeah, yes, naturally. They, they became, I became a tour member, I suppose. You, uh, they, they were prominent, especially Trevino. He had a gift. It was a peculiar swing he had at the ball, but um, it, it was magic when he got near the green, I must say. You won the Texas International in the United States in 1956. You finished with a 63. Uh, and you beat Kerry Middlecoff and Gene Littler in a playoff. What do you remember about that? Well, I remember the playoff because uh, I hold a putt from here to the uh, garage, <laughs> which won the title, which won the money. And my good friend uh, Mario Gonzalez was uh, playing, and because he, he didn't get into the playoff, but uh, he came with me as we marched off and uh, leapt for joy when I held this long putt and Littler, Littler and Middlecoff, they were really the cream of the pack in those times. You played in the US Masters eight times from 1953. Are you surprised at how large that tournament has become in the succeeding 60 years? Uh, yes, I'm surprised because it didn't have uh, any such uh, multitude, either player or watcher. Uh, at that time I entered the picture, 1952. And uh, of course the scribes that were invited found it a contrast to the previous uh, uh, invitations where they told the uh, uh, media people that keep behind the ropes and don't do this and don't do that. It was completely the opposite when Augusta called you. And they were able to sign for drinks and hamburgers and everything else they wanted. And so when they went back to their home states and newspaper, they'd say, the greatest tournament in, on the earth, we must go back there next year. So <laughs> that was the way it grew. It, it was sort of bribery in its way. <laughs> and what about Bobby Jones and Clifford Roberts, the two great founders of the US Masters? You, you met them? Uh, Jones told me that his ambition for the Masters was that there would be an entry of 30 pros, 30 amateurs and 30 foreigners. <laughs> so peculiar as that might sound, that, that, that would have been a really cream field if he'd had his wish and, he, and pursued it. 
you returned to the US in 1985 uh, to play on the senior tour and you won nine times. You finished top of the money list. Did you feel like you had a point to prove at all in the United States? No, I, I don't. No, I don't feel I should have pr proven anything. It's none, none of the, anybody's business but mine. <laughs> and I enjoyed myself, so I, uh, I did. I played the best golf of my life in those spectacular senior tournaments. And what was it about the senior tour in the United States that uh, that got you going? Well, tr to tell you a secret, um, uh, I had I had a special ball. It was made by the Dunlop Company in Tokyo, uh, and I began winning with this ball, and the players around me started to. to to be a suspect that I was had a special, a special ball to play with because everyone uh, didn't have else didn't have one. So they began to steal them out of my bag. <laughs> anyway, uh, but that ball was actually the sl the shortest ball of the whole lot you can buy in the pro shop. And. Uh, when I used it, it never got higher than, well, what you'd call uh, high. And so this this was a ball that didn't get up and go, but it went very direct. When I hit an iron shot, it, it didn't go much higher than this room. But it would take care of the distance and, and the fact that it was going directly to the target, that was the, the flag stick, uh, was a big advantage. Because the next year, uh, I, in January, I phoned up t Tokyo, Dunlop, J uh, Japan, said, please send me another box of balls, or gross of balls, because I want to go back to the US tour. And he said, uh, Oh, I'm sorry, we don't make that ball anymore. I said, what a, I've won, uh, what is it, 21 tournaments, no, 11 tournaments by now, and you don't make the ball anymore? What's wrong going? So, anyway, he said, oh, well, you'll find it's, uh, it'll fly better. Well, of course, it went up here and up high, and the wind got it, and I never did achieve that accuracy. I, I would suggest they ought to st start reproducing that again, but uh, they won't. What about Tiger Woods? You said early on in his career that he was a slugger and that eventually his body would fall apart. Do you think you were right about that? I think so. It's been proven the fact of the matter. Uh, he's instinctively a he gives it a full bore every shot when it's not necessary. And there's certainly no smoothness uh, in his action and in his work. So it had to happen, a crash. If, if, if he goes back to his, where he was at the beginning and, and smoothness, he might do better. Compare Tiger to uh, a man whose swing, I know you were, uh, you are a great admirer of Louis Oosthuizen. How do you compare the two? Oh yeah, what a beautiful action he's got. Um, not just beautiful, it's, uh, it's the best possible way to play golf, which is to, to do things smoothly and not slog. Do you think that we're entering a, a golden period for world golf with the likes of, of Rory McIlroy and Jordan Spieth and, and Jason Day? Um, do they herald some sort of great new era for world golf? We've had a golden year uh, or a period every year f since I was a boy. Uh, I don't think we'll ever go without a, a golden era. <laughs> it's always there. You are still the only captain of the international team to have won the uh, President's Cup. That was at uh, Royal Melbourne in 1998. You were in Korea this year to, to see the President's Cup. What do you think the future of the event is? 
that part of it, the mixture of, of nationalities, was its strength. And uh, I think it, it's that's a, again when they meet next time, it'll be multinational uh, tournament. And, and of course, team golf is different to individual. I think that has a place in the curriculum. And you've designed more than 100 golf courses around the world since your playing days finished. Has that given you a, a lot of pleasure? Oh, well, I've, I've done what I've done with partners who have been equally uh, enthusiastic and, and nice, but uh, it's a kind of a, uh, art artwork, I think. So uh, if I can change the world just a little bit with a bit of dirt, I, I get a lot of fun out of that. And does it bother you that in some parts of the world there are more courses being closed than there are courses being built? Or certainly in some parts of the world? Yes, it doesn't bother me, but a lot of people would be very worried, I think, if they'd invested uh, in, in a golf course in the wrong place. But um, now, looking at it from abroad, I think it's uh, pretty healthy. Peter, you won 88 professional tournaments worldwide, including uh, in Australia, New Zealand, Italy, Germany, Japan, Canada, Hong Kong, India. Do you think it's a pity that today's professionals seem so wedded to their own tours that they don't travel as much as players in your days did? The Hong Kong Open last week, uh, there was D Justin Rose, but I think he was the only Westerner uh, playing. I couldn't see anybody else. So is that the, 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 the tournaments, uh, the tournaments in Asia don't don't suffer from the fact that there aren't West, more Western players playing? No, they do not. That's what's evident. What about the issue of appearance money? Do you think that has been good for world golf? I've stood up all my life to to stop it uh, because, and I I sort of led a good example by not accepting any or not asking for any. Uh, but I know it went on and secretly mostly. But uh, it doesn't need to be anymore. If, if the money is there, prize money is there, and, when, and that's where it is now, then the outcome is good. Jason Day won this year's US PGA with a score of 20 under par on a course that was nearly 7,000 metres long. Did you ever think you'd see a score of 20 under par winning a major tournament? I'm not surprised because they've got the skill, they've got everything in their favour, that even the turf grass they play on is much improved from where it used to be, which has helped lower the score. And um, then the, the clubs they wield and the balls they use, it, it must get better and better at scoring, must. You couldn't stop it. Peter, you're a, a member of the Order of the British Empire, uh, a commander of the Order of the British Empire. You received a centenary medal in Australia and an Order of Australia. Looking back at your career, is there anything you'd change? Any, any regrets? <laughs> um, I don't know that I'd want to change anything. I've been a very lucky player, um, although I, I have to say I played in 30 Open Championships and I lost 25 of them, <laughs> but it wasn't so bad. Many years ago, you brought back one of your British Open trophies and you let your son Andrew uh, take it to school with him to show his mates. Tell us that story. Uh, he went off one morning with the, uh, the cup, the claret jug in his, in his school bag. And then in the afternoon I was at home about four o'clock and I saw him come through the gate and I, with his head down and, and <laughs> anyway, I, I opened the door and I go, come in son, what's, what's happened to you? He, he said, the boys rubbished me. <laughs> one, one kid said his dad's got 14 of those. <laughs> uh, Peter, 50 years after you won your 
first British Open at Birkdale, you returned to Birkdale with photographer Kim Baker and you were talking about a, a shot that you hit into a par three uh, 50 years earlier. I think you hit it to a metre or a four iron and, and Kim said, can you still see the shot, Peter? And you said, see it, I can still feel it. Can you still feel it? I can. I can well, because it was a, a sort of a cut, open face cut. You hold it against the crosswind. You hit it to a metre. Yeah, and missed the putt. <laughs> Peter, thanks for your time today. It's been a great pleasure. Uh, it's been a pleasure.